Well, I think we're ready to get started. Um, welcome everyone. My name is Han Vinson. I'm the Public Programs Manager here at the Westmoreland Museum of American Art. Before we begin the program, I wanted to start with a moment of acknowledgement. We would like to recognize the importance of the role cultural institutions have in the formation of collective memory. As part of that work, we want to acknowledge that the Westmoreland Museum of American Art is situated upon the traditional lands of the Adena, Hopewell, Monongahela, Osage, Delaware, Shawnee, Seneca, and Seneca Cayuga peoples. We honor all of the indigenous nations and their land with great gratitude. As a Museum of American Art, we use the power of art to explore and reveal the erasure of many lived experiences that comprise the complexity of American history. But a land acknowledgement is just the first step in supporting Native peoples, and there are many ways to expand the support, including visiting exhibitions like Action Abstraction Redefined, Modern Native Art, 1945 through 1975, that open on February 26th and runs through May 28th and attending programs like this one to learn more about Native history from Native people and Native-led institutions and organizations. Today's program is generously supported by Art Bridges. At today's In Conversation, we'll be joined by our Chief Curator at the Westmoreland, Jeremiah William McCarthy, the Chief Curator at the IAIA Museum of Contemporary Native Arts, Manuela Wellhoffman, and Peter Jones, an artist whose work is featured in the show. As we're discussing, please, free to put, please feel free to put any um, comments or questions you have in the chat. So welcome Manuela and Peter, and I'm going to pass it over to Jeremiah to begin. Thanks, Han. Um, hi, everyone. Like Han said, uh, my name's Jeremiah. Um, if you haven't been to the museum before, um, the Westmoreland Museum of American Art is just outside of Pittsburgh. Um, in southwestern Pennsylvania, and we have this extraordinary exhibition up, um, so we thought it's a good time to have a conversation. So I'll just, we thought the way that we would um, run this is uh, Manuela would talk a little bit about um, the institution that she's at and the making of the show, and then we would move to Peter and his work, and then we'd have a conversation. Uh, but before we do that, let me just intro people pretty quickly. Um, so uh, Dr. Manuela Welloff Mann is the chief curator at the Institute of American Indian Arts Museum of Contemporary Native Arts in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Previously, she was curator at Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art and the Montana Museum of Art and Culture. Uh, she has more than 20 years of curatorial experience in museums and galleries, and she's curated national and international contemporary native art exhibitions. Um, and I would say sometimes as curators, we do shows that sometimes don't move outside our own areas of expertise. But I think what's amazing about the, the work that Manuel has done is it's been able to um, expand some of the parameters of what people think about when they think American art. Um, and then Peter B. Peter B. Jones is a clay artist of the Onondaga tribe in New York State. Uh, he studied at the Institute of American Indian Art, and in 1977, he returned to his home, and since then, he's increased the visibility of Iroquois or Haudenosaunee pottery, uh, both inside and outside his home communities. Uh, Peter works within the Six Nations Iroquois communities of the Seneca, Cayuga, Onondaga, Oneida, Mohawk, and Tuscarora people, um, and quite excitingly, in 2018, he was nominated for a Community Spirit Award. Um, so we're very thrilled to have two very distinguished panelists with us talking about this material. Um, so Manuela, I'll kick it over to you. Well, thank you so much for your kind introduction and for inviting me to be part of the Westmoreland Museum's public programs. So yeah, I would like to give a brief um, overview of our institution, the Institute of American Indian Art, also known as IAIA, and also an overview of action abstraction redefined. And yeah. So action abstraction redefined is the first major traveling exhibition that analyzes modern native art from the mid 1940s through the 1970s mm -hmm. that was inspired mm -hmm. by 
abstract expressionism, including color field and hard edge painting. Artists explored new ways of artistic expression and challenged stereotypical expectations of American Indian art. The majority of the paintings, sculptures, and works on paper were actually created at IIA in Santa Fe, New Mexico. IIA's revolutionary art education approach encouraged experimentation and risk-taking. Artists experimented with New York, New York art style influences as well as abstract native art traditions. So similar to abstract expressionists who broke with uh, realism and uh, were interested in experimentation, our IARA artist redefined the concept of abstraction by creating works informed by their own by their own abstract art traditions and practices, as well as influences coming from New York. Um, to really understand why these works were so groundbreaking, one needs to have a look at Native art education before IERA. So, for example, during the 1920s, uh, teachers were directed not to allow students to create Native-themed artworks. In addition, many Native American youth were involuntarily enrolled in government-run boarding schools and further distancing them from their families and cultures. The Indian Re uh, Reorganization Act of 1934 tried to, to reverse the goal of cultural ass assimilation into white society. For example, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, also known as by BIA, hired art instructor Dorothy Dunn, we see her here on the left, to teach painting at the Santa Fe Indian School. And even though Dorothy Dunn's studio encouraged her students to embrace native subject matter, art historians later criticized her for her teaching style. Um, so many art historians said um, her teaching uh, style really um, reinforced stereotypical depictions of Native Americans and she taught only one um, style that was very nostalgic and decorative. So one of her students, for example, was Pop Shali. And um, here to the right, um, it's a really characteristic painting. Um, it kind of um, illustrates the style Dorothy Dunn taught, um, so very um, ornamental, decorative, and um, nostalgic. Then during the termination period, during the 1940s and 60s, government policies tried to dissolve all reservations and federal recognition of tribes and prevent Native Americans to practice their culture. Many Native families were also moved to urban centers like Los Angeles. Realizing a great loss of history, culture, and art could result, the Association on American Indian Affairs held a conference at the University of Arizona in 1961, addressing the future of Native art. One of the outcomes was the founding of the Southwestern Indian Art Project. During the summers of 19, from 1960 to 63, Native youth from around the country were instructed in contemporary arts with great success. The, the Southwestern Indian Art Project was based upon the progressive educational concepts of Cherokee artist and educator Lloyd Kivanyu and featured an experimental art curriculum for Native students. The success of the Southwest Indian Art Project then led to the establishment of the Institute of American Indian Art in Santa Fe, 1962. So here on the left, we see a group photo showing early faculty members. For example, here in the center, we see Fritz Scholder next to him, Lloyd Kivanyu. And um, the picture on the right, we have to go back real quick, shows our one of our early campuses. Um, so um, Lloyd Kivanyu wrote, Indian art of the future will be in new forms, produced in new media and with new technolo 
technological method. The end result will be as Indian as the Indian artist. The artworks created at the Institute of American Indian Arts in the 1960s to the 70s really illustrate a dramatic shift in Native American art. So on the left, we see a photo of one of the early studio spaces. So it really looks like um, this all happened in the basement. I heard stories that um, the early um, classrooms were in kind of World War II barracks in the maybe Peter can also share some insights um, when um, he will talk about his artworks. So many of the paintings in this exhibition were created by students under the age of 20, most between ages of 15 and 18 years old. It was important for them to learn from the older students as well as to rely upon each other for support and inspiration. Phyllis Five, uh, Muscogee Creek, artist. Uh, she was one of the first students at IIA. She talked about her exposure to contemporary art styles. So she, she said the action painter techniques, that was something that was the most exciting. It was a freeing style. It was a total departure from the Dorothy Dunn style of painting, things that were very confined and two-dimensional. Phyllis Five also described the IAIE curriculum from a student perspective and said, no one gave, gave us instruction, no one set guidelines when we were in the studio. We were kind of given a natural approach to learning, a learning by doing. So this um, exhibition um, was organized by stylistic influences. Um, the painting by Alfred Youngman, um, is titled Indian Blanket. Um, it's a painting from 1968. Even though desi the design reminds viewers of a mid 19th century Navajo blanket, it also evokes works by color field painter um, Barnett Newman, um, particularly um, his monumental work Voice of Fire from 1967. Um, similar to Barnett Newman's work, um, as we can see here, uh, Alfred Youngman's uh, painting is composed of broad vertical blue and red stripes. And similar to um, Barnett Newman's work, Al Alfred Youngman's painting imparts a strong sense of presence if viewed from up on close. Alice Loisel experimented with an action painting style reminiscent of Jackson Pollock. In her painting, Sky Woman, she dripped, splattered, and spilled black, white, and red oil paint and spread some of the red colors with a few gestural brushstrokes on the dark red, red background. Even though Loisel's painting technique is similar to Pollock's, she clearly reinterprets it for her own purposes to tell the story of Sky Woman, that's the right figure we see here on the left, um, a spiritual being from her Ojibwe culture's creation story. Uh, in this context, the drips and splatters also remind of stars of the universe. George Morrison is probably the best known Native American expressionist, abstract expressionist. He attended the Art Students League uh, from 1943 to 46 and immersed himself in the New York art scene. In fact, for years, he was better known in the abstract expressionism movement than within American Indian art circles. Uh, he grew up near, the lake, uh, near Lake Superior and his relationship to the land was essential to his identity. So we see here two of his iconic white paintings. Um, it's white and Ryan, and Ryan on the left and white painting number one on the right. So he began this series in the mid 1960s. Um, these paintings are characterized by their remarkable texture and painterly qualities using white as unifying factor. In the center of white painting number one, one can see totem-like figures. Um, abstract expressionists explored indigenous symbols and motifs in response to the turbulent times after World War II. While non-native artists friends freely borrowed from other cultures, 
Morrison didn't have to look far. Um, he often created these evocative uh, compositions spontaneously, letting his unconscious mind direct his artistic imagination. Unfortunately, many non-native abstract expressionists included motives from different indigenous cultures without asking for permission or without giving these artists credit. They didn't treat their fellow indigenous um, artists as peers, really. Also part of this exhibition is a large group of um, hard edge paintings. Um, hard edge painting is closely related to color field painting. However, unlike the more painterly color field painting works, hard edge is known for its more impersonal execution, execution and smooth surface planes. So we have works by Neil Parson, that's this one here on the left, Carl Tabby, that's on the right, as well as Don Montillo and Harvey Herman. And they combine geometric designs of their own cultural her heritage, including inspiration from beadwork, weaving, pottery, basketry, and parfleche paintings with the clean lines and flat, bold colors of hard edge paintings used by, for example, Ellsworth Kelly, Kenneth Noland, and Frank Stella. So this is an example by Don Montillo. Um, he is um, Lakota and uh, lives in South Dakota. Um, this is an early work that depicts large geometric shapes and incorporates traditional symbols. The title is Four Legs of Life and refers to the four directions, which are sacred in many indigenous cultures. Each direction has a special meaning and color associated with it. The painting evokes traditional Plains Indian beadwork pattern and combines Lakota abstract designs with stylistic elements of hard edge painting. Um, the clean, one can see the clean lines and pure flat colors. Also part of this exhibition is a large group of works on paper. So on the left side, we have Anita Fields and on the right side, Edna Messi. So Edna Messi, uh, for the longest time we thought she is um, one, or she was one of our students, but uh, thanks to the research by co-curator Lara Evans, we now know that Edna Messi um, had a really long career in civil service with the Bureau of Indian Affairs and the Indian Arts and Craft Board. So she was known for her printmaking and textile designs often using silk screening. She also um, was known for her interior designs. Uh, she designed um, the interior of um, offices at the BRA. And um, she also traveled extensively and purchased much of the collection for the Indian Arts and Crafts Board, including our two George Morrison paintings. We also have uh, a group of fantastic 3D works, ceramic works, sculptures. So on the right side, we see um, a work by Dark Height titled Sun and Moon Gods, which features uh, painted nails that from a distance really look like beadwork and they add to the complex texture and personality of his work. Similar to abstract expressionist, spontaneous working method, Height explained, I work directly in most of my sculptures and try never to use pre-planned ideas. Color and textures are very important. And sun and moon gods also evokes a petroglyph or depictions of spiritual beings. So I mentioned ceramic works. Um, we have wonderful works by Peter B. Jones included in Action Abstraction Redefined. And I would like to hand it over to Peter to talk about his work himself. Peter? Yes, hello. Um, the work on the screen now is one I did when I was in high school at the Institute. It might have been a year, a year after. I spent approximately five years there. 
two years in, in high school from 62 to 65. And then again, um, three years with the postgraduate program and uh, spent my time the whole time in, in ceramics, pottery. And this was my version of a landscape of New, Me of New Mexico. And the uh, lettering and things was taken from a uh, telephone pole that uh, I used as a, to create this image of what I thought was where I was in, in New Mexico at the school. I went there when it first opened, I was in uh, 11th grade high school and stayed, like I said, until 1968 and left the Institute. Um, I was there when Doug Hyde was there, Tom Cannon, uh, quite a few, even Donald Montalo was there. And I remember his uh, hard edge paintings at the time. Uh, a lot of them were reflective of the uh, Parfetch paintings of the plains. And he even got into some beadwork designs on some of these paintings. Doug went on to work into uh, stone mainly. He uh, experimented with a few pieces of wood and, uh, and other materials, but he primarily just did stone under the tutelage of uh, Ellen Hauser. We were lucky at that point to have uh, native teachers uh, like Ellen Hauser, um, Adelie Loloma, let's see who else was there. Um, Neil Parsons, he was in one of your slides. Uh, there was quite a few actually, and it was a whole different uh, different way of learning because we have a different way of thinking and we could think and they could think just like you know us. And then at first it was like uh, putting a hundred students in a studio with paint brushes and seeing who could make a masterpiece and as opposed to a hundred monkeys. But we were quite the attraction during the early days because it was a, an experiment. It was an experiment not only by us, it was an experiment for the teachers. They had never been given free reign and some of them were never teachers. They were artists in the top, top uh, echelon of their of their practice. So it was really exciting to get in there and everyone uh, learned a lot from, from the freestyle of, of teaching. Um, I don't know if, I know Fritz Shoulder had a uh, extensive college background and a lot of times he taught design and painting. And I took design from him, but you know, I could not understand what he was talking about. I didn't have the formal background to, to go into uh, <laughs> the different things and ideas that he had. Um, there's still, I was still uh, in high school when I had him as a teacher. So, but like you said, we looked at everybody's art. We can, we uh, criticize each other. We, learn from each other and kept going for uh, however long it took. And a lot of us uh, are still working today. Not very many anymore, but quite a few. And uh, trying to get to this point where we're at now, where we're being recognized as artists rather than Indian artists or native artists, we're artists. And uh, our work, I think, reflects that. It's just that no one expected it and no one knew what to think about it. Uh, and I think part of the problem was that they didn't understand our culture to begin with. And rather than learn about our culture from our work, 
they dismissed it as work by amateur Indian artists. So I think that's been the problem for the last 40, 50 years. And, you know, most cultures embrace another culture's art, but that really didn't happen for us. Uh, Picasso said everybody steals from, from everybody else. The trick is to steal from the best. And we took that as a kind of a guideline for who we copied or who we worked. Uh, like their art, like Hauser's art, if we like his art, we have uh, students working in that style. And especially uh, Tommy Cannon and uh, Tommy Cannon was picked up by a, an art collector and he furthered his uh, he furthered his career by collecting his work and then he had them show together with Fritz Shoulder early on. And uh, that was the beginning of his uh, career, short career at that. But uh, we understood what we were trying to do when we first got to the Institute. They said, we want you to base your art on your cultural background and some of us uh, were at the point where we were losing contact with our cultural background and so it was a, a learning curve right there read things about our, our tribes and things and and uh, learn things that we should have learned at home but we didn't um, partly because a lot of the, the uh, cultural aspects were banned or not being followed. They're trying to assimilate us as quickly as possible. My, I went to Thomas Indian School in, on the reservation in New York uh, from kindergarten all the way up to sixth grade. And then the sixth grade, they decided that we needed to be mainstreamed in public school. So everybody was uh, sent to public schools around the area. And that was a big culture shock right there. Uh, we were kind of isolated on our reservation. And uh, we only went to the store if we had to buy something, you know, went to town or whatever. And uh, so it was a, a big change coming uh, to the public school. And there was a lot of uh, uh, hostile attitude, hostile atmosphere. And that's when I decided to go to Santa Fe because most of the public schools and a lot of them still are uh, mainly focusing on football, basketball, sports, you know, and I just wasn't into that. I, I, um, I didn't like getting hurt. <laughs> so I went to uh, IIA to do art, which was, uh, I originally went there to study uh, commercial art, which was like media at the time without the computers. It was illustrating magazines and advertisements and things like that. And that was the big job to have back then. And uh, when I got there, I wasn't gaining much. Uh, from the instructor that was teaching commercial art. So I switched my major over to ceramics and stayed with that for the rest of my life. Still doing that today. And uh, I've been teaching. When I came back to New York, I, I realized there was no, uh, there was no one doing traditional Iroquois pots at the time. Um, they were doing Iroquois style pots on a potter's wheel and using designs on the pottery. This was uh, mainly the Smith family in Canada. And um, I was wondering how we used our pottery, how we made it. 
at that time because we didn't have kilns, we didn't have any any of that. It was similar to the Pueblo pottery, but uh, I ended up researching and studying, going to different museums just to find out more about our own pottery and um, found out that I'm, I'm still studying. <laughs> There's a lot of questions that I can't answer, but I'm close and uh, especially like mixing clays that would be usable in, the, in a cooking fire, things like that. And just questions keep coming up. So I'm still working on that. I've been 40 years doing that now. I've been 60 some years working in clay altogether. So a large part of my uh, work has been sculpture and pottery and uh, reviving the Haudenosaunee style pottery as best I can. I see a piece poking out here. This is one I did in Santa Fe at the Institute, probably uh, first year post-grad, I'm gonna say, depending on what year it was, might've been. I was just learning to throw on the wheel. And uh, mixing glazes and different things. This is really a, a, a statement about the earth, and mushrooms, and also about the culture at the time, the 60s, the drug, drug influences. But, uh, I've been asked to do this one again, but I cannot duplicate the glaze. Mm. Wish I could. <laughs> Peter, do you remember like the sort of moment where you were like, okay, this is it, like clay is for me, or like the, be, even beyond ceramics, just like this devotion to clay? Um, I did work in clay before I went to the Institute, but uh, it was just for myself. There was a couple of teachers that lived on a reservation just down the road from my house. And they were teaching in Buffalo and had access to a kiln and clay. So they would bring me clay and I would make little things and he would take them back to the school where he worked and fire them for me. But when I got to the Institute, like I said, I was uh, set on being a commercial artist and that didn't work out. I studied under Audley Lolama and her husband, Charles. Charles was always a critic. <laughs> Didn't matter what you worked in, he was a critic. <laughs> so it was kind of interesting. And our studios were right next to each other, uh, the ceramic studio and the jewelry studio. So, but um, I knew then that I, I wanted to stick with pottery and I have, and uh, Oddly was instrumental in that uh, because she said uh, all, you know, our philosophy too is everything has a life and clay being an organic thing has a life. Um, I want to try with the uh, repatriation things going on where they're bringing back uh, pottery goods from graves. And it makes it hard because they tell the, the tribe they have to positively identify that it came from their tribe. And with us, we're, our pots look very similar to the Hopewell. They look similar to the uh, Catawba, south, uh, Southeast. And uh, what I'm trying to or want to do, if I can, uh, is take DNA samples from clay and uh, match them up with clay deposits uh, in the areas where the pots were found and the villages that were there. Because most of them are, are uh, identified in old maps and things like that. And uh, but if you can match the DNA to the, to the clay, 
you pretty much got a, a good start on who it belongs to. And uh, get rid of that other uh, obstacle in the road to repatriation. But uh, that's a long way off yet, <laughs> that, that idea. Anybody else? I have a question about the ceramic piece that's in action abstraction. So when I saw it for the first time, I was really surprised. I said, oh, I wonder if the artist looked actually at um, abstract expressionist ceramic artist work like Peter Volkos. You know, when you think about the slab construction, is that something that inspired you technically? Peter Vocals was a, uh, a hero of our lottery teacher at IIA, Ralph Huntington, and uh, he was from Cranbrook. But we had different teachers come in, like uh, not teachers, potters, like Toshiko Tokaizo. She was uh, at the school once, and oh. she threw a perfect orb on the wheel, and then at the end she just gave it a jerk and and said nothing's perfect. That stuck with me for a long time, <laughs> you know? And uh, just little things that happened at the school like that really stuck with me. And uh, oddly was a, also a critic right until the end there, she I showed her some of my sculptures that I'd started doing in the 70s and the 80s. And she said, they need to be bigger. <laughs> Everything needed to be bigger. You know, and the largest I ever got was, uh, well, I'd done a few very large pieces, but I didn't have the, the kiln to fire them in. And um, so that, that's one of the problems when you graduate from school. And I keep telling my kids, my students, that take advantage of the, the machines we got here, you know, the kilns, the wheels the clay puggers, everything, you know, because when you're on your own, you, you have to build that all up uh, before you can even start your studio, you know. And so I teach them from the, from the ground up how to use a coil method, slab method. And the slab is sort of from Volkos. Uh, there's, there's quite a few um, 50s potters. I studied at Archie Gray Foundation for a summer with uh, uh, Val Cushing, who was a very uh, good production potter and uh, tried, he's tried to do different styles of his own. And uh, he was very popular, he was a very good teacher. And while we were at uh, Archie Bray, it was being run by uh, Chuck Shainer was also a potter and we had um, a group a uh, few professors from Elford stop in to see uh, Val so we got some like Sperry uh, just that the whole group of uh, 60s late 50s after the war potters uh -huh. they came out they went on went to school on their GI bill and took pottery you know so that was really, really exciting, really. I learned more there, I think, than I would have anywhere else. Yeah, I'm very familiar with the Archie Bray. Um, I started my career here in Montana, so uh, you were at the right place in the right time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was. It was uh, really a good place. Now it's grown so much. When I was there, it was just the beehive kilns and uh, Dave Schreiner's house was in a converted chicken house, chicken shack. It was, uh, you know, but everybody got along. <laughs> the only thing about Montana, though, they had a forest fire that could pull you off the streets <laughs> and send you to it. But that was exciting, too. But does anybody have any other questions? We did get a question in the chat. So someone's asking how. Um, were people chosen for admittance to the school? When I was there, uh, you had to send them a portfolio, you know, draw a shoe, draw this. And 
sort of like the, uh, <laughs> can you draw this man on the matchbook? <laughs> the matchbook covers that they used to have. Can you draw this image? You'll win a scholarship. Anyway, you know, that's what we had to do is submit some, some work. Most of us being, or not most of us, but a lot of us who didn't really have an art background, um, kind of had to make up something, you know, and send it in, usually from your high school art teacher, and set up a portfolio of different things. And that's how they got chosen. Uh, we had at one point 500 students, and at one point probably 100 to 200 at one time, depending on funding. It's the only congressionally funded Indian art school in the United States. And most of the congressional funding has gone by the wayside because it's been 60 years since they were opening. So, but they're doing, doing very well. And uh, I just wish they had more native teachers. When they uh, switched over from uh, wanting to be a college, uh, junior college first. Now it's a four-year college. And now they're adding uh, the uh, post, not postgraduate, master's programs in different things. It's taken them uh, since about the 70s when they started gearing up for that and moved to the new campus. Um, but at that time, in order to be accredited, you had to have accredited teachers, instructors, and there weren't a whole lot of us uh, that had a degree in art. So we got a lot of other people that came in that were interested in teaching. And they had to learn how we were, we had to learn how they were, <laughs> it went back and forth. So. And yeah, people. that was quite a time. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say, when you talk about these people, like Odali and Toshiko Takaizu, like for so many people, these are like legendary um, teachers. You know, these are people who were so transformative for the way people think about studio ceramics. And I wonder, could you talk a little bit about in your lifetime, like the, what you've witnessed in terms of the change and the sort of acceptance of studio ceramics now, like I think about how the way, you know, we view studio ceramics now versus the, um, the small amount of shows or circulating exhibitions in the 60s that were available around objects and makers and sort of this shift. So could you, could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, the, um, I'm in the area which is fairly close to Syracuse, in the Everson Museum. Oh, yeah. And the Everson Museum used to sponsor the uh, International Ceramics Exhibition every year. That was in the 60s and 70s. And that's, that gave a lot of uh, exposure to artists, pottery artists, that were trying to break the mold. Um, as native artists, our main thing was uh, trying to break the mold, but still keep the tradition. Mm -hmm. And that, that, especially if you're using like uh, stoneware clay or a whiteware clay, that's not, um, that's not indigenous. It's, you buy it from the, the ceramics place and stuff. And the other thing is, uh, there was um, there's a definition between uh, production pottery and art pottery. And uh, I used to have a little button that I wore at craft shows that said, I don't do crafts, <laughs> even though I'm sitting there with a bunch of pots. <laughs> but uh, I've always had that. Uh, it's because of Takisho, Takaizu, and uh, all of them, John Kaniko, and, and they were doing things that people thought was impossible to do in clay. Mm. Like the huge, huge 
bigger monumental size clay things that Kaneko was doing. I mean, he worked from the inside, climb into the inside of the pot, finish the inside, climb back out. And, you know, it was similar to what uh, Alan Hauser was doing with carving stone, building scaffolds around the, the stone so he could get up there and carve. Um, they trying to do that and uh, making making uh, inroads into the ceramic arts was very hard uh, at the beginning. Um, people didn't recognize it as native art for one thing, just like some of the paintings and things they they didn't think that was uh, native enough. They were trying to trying to, uh, as usual, inform us of what we could and couldn't do as natives. And a long time, for a long time, our work, they didn't think we had an aesthetic sense. We had, uh, the only reason we made pottery was for some ritual or mystic idea. And they never gave us a, a credit for having a sense of beauty and just doing something because it was beautiful. So that whole thing is still needing to change. And the only thing that's gonna change it is more shows of uh, the artists we have now. I'm putting together a, a show. It's not a show, it's a workshop here on the reservation that will bring in maybe 10 or 15 traditional potters, Iroquois, Hadidna Shawnee potters, where we can share each other's techniques, methods, uh, and then end up with um, cooking with these pots at the end with uh, indigenous foods. Uh, we've done some in that area, but we should do a lot more. My aim is to have uh, one or two people on each of the Six Nation reservations that can do pottery for cooking in, or just plain pottery, just uh, the traditional style pottery. And uh, I don't uh, force them to do anything. I teach them how they can manipulate the clay. And then I leave it up to them to how they want to do that and what they want to make. So, so far it's going good. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I had a show at the Everson early on. It was the same show I had at Santa Fe early on of Prophecy. That was when, uh, well, what's his name? Mohawk, he was running the museum then. Oh. Uh, can't think, getting old. <laughs> Well, oh, anything else? We did, we have a question, um, Peter, when you were talking about your work in life, um, you said that at the school, there was sort of a different way of thinking that you and your fellow students brought. Um, could you maybe talk a little bit about this? Or I think maybe to rephrase this, it's like so much of, so much of like contemporary culture is about like scrolling and the internet and this constant sort of um, instant uh, fast pace. And I think that sometimes in a native worldview, there's like a much bigger scope of thinking of like generationally or thinking um, thinking about slow looking and thinking about taking time to think about things, to make things. And so how do you, like, even in your work, like, how do you, how do you preserve this way of working and thinking and making in the face of sometimes a world that seems like inhospitable to it, or like a culture that seems to be just like increasing at a pace that's almost unsustainable? way of thought as I experience it. <laughs> um, they, there's been some studies where artistic people and natives 
are left brained or right brained. Mm -hmm. And it takes a whole different way of thinking about stuff. Um, not just your art, but your, your life. What uh, I like to, I don't, I do sketch occasionally, but it's usually just so I don't forget it, an idea. But I like to work straight from the clay and let it go, let it direct me where it wants to go. Um, you think about, we're losing that, by the way, because of media, um, cell phones and all that. that that's uh, imitation life being on that. It's a good way to, um, it's a good way to express things. But uh, I was thinking today, there's somebody starting a library somewhere and who's gonna read those books? And you got people down south that are burning them and, uh, or want to. Uh, we're just being driven in the opposite direction of how we were taught. And I'm glad I'm an artist and, and have a skill that I also create um, pottery or sculptures that reflect where we are now. Uh, I have a, a one-man show coming up at the Everson in August, and it's a, a grouping of 30 pieces that I've done over the years from the 60s all the way to present. And there's some very political things in there. There's uh, not just uh, non-native political, but native political too. Um, I think the, the main thing that is an obstacle is not understanding who we are. Um, and we're at a crossroads now, I think, of trying to figure out where we're going with this. Um, we don't need all this stuff that we have. Uh, and I see it, see it on reservations and different places with the casino money coming in and all this stuff. People having boats in the yard, and you know, it reminded me of when the Navajos got their uranium money. You go by a reservation out there, and there would be refrigerators and washing machines and all this stuff out there, and they didn't have electric, and they didn't have water, water, you know, they just bought it because they could, you know, and uh, it just, it's completely illogical and if you just stop and think about what we were taught even as children uh, who you respect your parents you respect the older folks and they're the ones that are supposed to be guiding us and now I'm an older folk so I'm trying <laughs> but uh, I have a lot of experience in different things but uh, I remember going to Charles Loloma picked me up at school at the dormitory and said, you want me to work? Because we were students, we could go work for other uh, instructors and things. So we loaded up his car, put all the, we were working on his studio out there in Hope Villa. And uh, loaded his car with the, uh, you know, chainsaw, uh, circular saws, all the, extension cores, everything, we got everything ready. And then we drove out to his, uh, his Pueblo. And he got there and realized we didn't have electric. <laughs> we couldn't use any of those tools. <laughs> so we had to get, go back a few steps and, you know, hand saw things and <laughs> get rid of all the power tools. So that was a, a pretty good learning experience. <laughs> I grew up without electric and running water. Uh, I had electric, but it was like one one light bulb in each room, you know. But uh, and uh, running water was down the hill. You run after it. So I, I could understand it. You know? I was in Bulgaria and uh, I was telling those people there. I said I could live this way, you know. You're standing there, and all of a sudden a, a 
two wheel buggy with rubber tires being pulled by a horse. You know, <laughs> I thought it was great. But they, they didn't understand why I would want to live that way, you know. But why not? <laughs> Grew up that way pretty much. Yeah, if we if we can get uh, more people to understand what we're trying to do, if we can understand what we're trying to do, what we have to do. Um, when uh, COVID took over, people were scared, they were freaking out. They didn't know how to how to live without Walmart. You know, there's nothing on the shelves. What are we gonna do? You know can't break bread, <laughs> you know, stuff like that. It was just kind of scary to think that. As I grew up, I was uh, self-sufficient on the uh, reservation. Most people had a garden, we traded items. Someone had a cow, we trade for milk, you know, eggs. But nowadays, it's, you know, it's, it's just not there. <laughs> Some people, but not really. And I so wonder somebody if you, asked a question there, but I wonder. I think when I'm working. I oh think. yeah, the aesthetic, the idea of aesthetics, or how, um, how, how you think about the idea of aesthetics. Hmm. I um, when I'm working, I'll set out a. If I have a good idea, I can uh, put it down in, in clay, uh, my thoughts on different things. And uh, a lot of my work, one of my pieces that's going to be in the Syracuse show is called The Pope and the Innocents. And I'm kind of wondering how that's going to be received because it's actually a portrait of the Pope sitting in his throne with all these little kids hanging around him and one or two peeking out from under his gown. You know, it's not, it's not um, in your face, but if you look at it, you know what I mean. You know, that's the kind of work I do, I like to do, you know, make you think about things things that I think about. And you said one earlier, you said one of the things that the primary kind of challenges is to like understand who we are or like to reveal to yourself what you are. And I, it makes me think about like Manuela, it makes me think about exhibitions, you know, like exhibitions are one of the ways you start to understand who people are and the way you share knowledge. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how exhibitions become something that increases kind of collective experience and knowledge and how you build that. Even if you think about um, how so many of the things you're trying to say in the exhibition might be incompatible sometimes or framed with this way of like Facebook and the cell phones and all this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've done and I've seen, um, particularly at Powell's, uh, people in full full dress that are dancing. And then after the dance, they'll be standing there with their cell phone. <laughs> you know, it's just incongruent to me. But I, I, I don't think I could function without my cell phone because that's how I do most of my business. But uh, having exhibitions and, and shows and things like that, I like to do the one-on-one -on -one where people actually come and ask you questions about your culture. What does this mean? What does that mean? You know, and I'm, I'm, I don't do sacred things. So I don't feel bad about telling them what I think. I mean, um, I, thought, I thought of something just then and it went away. But, uh, yeah, the, the, it's a meeting of the minds. When I was showing one time at Lane Horwich in Scottsdale, I had this piece, I think it's in the Heard Museum now, but it's a, an Indian sitting on the beach with his flowery uh, 
swimming trunks on, sunglasses, and his braids, and he's holding a, a nice cool drink, you know. And this lady came up to me, and she says, you're making fun of Indians. <laughs> it was called Palm Springs Indian, because at the time, they were one of the richest tribes in the States. Anyway, and she said, you're making fun of Indians. And I said, what? And she says, I said, well, if we can't, who can? <laughs> I'm an Indian, <laughs> native anyway. <laughs> so that's the that's the kind of thing you back and forth you can run into at, at shows and exhibits. Why are you doing this? You know, it, it's there. It's it's true. It's truth. You can't get mad at that. You know, you might not understand it, but you you can't really get mad at it. It's the way we are. Anything else? Manuela? Yeah, so the, one of the great things here at Mokna is um, we often, through our exhibitions, provide a platform for artists to really voice concerns, to address current issues. And as curators, and I think Jeremiah can agree, we, we work directly with artists, you know, we visit artists in studios, we stay in, in touch and really try to learn what artists are interested in. And based on that uh, information, we build our in exhibitions. Right. And um, this um, action abstraction redefined, it's a great tool to share um, also collections, collections of modern and contemporary native art with many museums and their audiences. And what I really like about um, Action Abstraction is it went only to non-native museums, mainstream art museums that are now more than ever interested in learning more about these art movements. Right. And modern native art, contemporary art uh, tendencies. So, so I think um, it's, it's a great uh, success story that so many non-native museums booked this show. And um, I also have another um, traveling exhibition, Exposure, Native Art and Political Ecology. Peter, you mentioned the uranium on Navajo Nation. Mm -hmm. that's, that's an exhibition that really talks about the effects of um, radiation on indigenous communities. So again, there is there was a need to tell that story. We all know about the first atomic bomb, how it was developed in Los Alamos, close to Santa Fe, but nobody really knows that the places where these bombs were tested is actually mainly on Aboriginal lands. It was right. close to the Apache uh, Mescalero Reservation in Australia on Aboriginal lands. So exhibitions really serve an important um, purpose to, to, to really tell hidden histories, to tell stories nobody else will tell but the artist. And as an art historian, I often feel that artists are of the first ones who sense there is something we need to address, there's something wrong in society. So that's why I really enjoy my job as a curator, to <laughs> not only learn about issues, but also help really share those stories. Yeah, it's like the, uh, the most contemporary one now is the Bears Ears uh, land. Yeah. And up in that area, in the Utes and things, and now they discovered the rare metals that they need to complete their, uh, well, mostly media stuff or rocket ships or things like that. that they really electric need. cars, you know, nobody really talks about how much soil has to be moved, how much water gets polluted right. to get a tiny lithium battery. And they, the, property that it's on belongs to the natives up there. Mm -hmm. And they're trying to pass some laws where they can mine a little bit on this land that was set aside for us. It's not, uh, and that has happened throughout history. Uh, the Trail of Broken Treaties is, is long. 
and it's still happening. That's one thing most people don't understand is how how uh, we live with this every day, and it's the change. I mean, it's hard to trust a people that don't deserve trust, you know, and it's only about money. It all comes down to money. We were talking today about how Congress and the Senate and everybody, they're not doing anything for us at all. And you take a, I don't see how people can let them get away with what they've gotten away with. I mean, most senators and congressmen that were elected, say, 30, 40 years ago, are now millionaires or more. And it's because of all this legislation and this hand that they have on, on uh, uh, the pharmacies and the pharmaceuticals that pay them through the back door to pass laws that would allow them to keep doing what they're doing. You know, it, it's, it's not right and it's got to change. It's affecting us too, because that is one thing we learned from the white man is how to be crooked. And that's not a good thing. It's this, especially I think at this moment, it's this really interesting, or no, I wouldn't say interesting. I don't know what the word is for it, but this paradox of like, on the one hand, native issues being totally invisible in a broader context but then in the art world like this is a moment like in the past couple of years where with like hearts of our people these really big shows that become visible and the Joan Quick to see Smith show now at the Whitney mm -hmm. and there's a lot of increased visibility of this material and it's it's this interesting paradox where it's like as the visibility is increasing in the art world I'm not sure the same kind of visibility outside in broader society is it's matching or it's there's some parity between yeah. the two things. Yeah, that's uh yeah, it's not interesting. It's it's kind of scary. Yeah, kind of um, terrifying it, actually, instead of interesting. It run that way. But uh yeah, I just had a pot uh go into the collection at the net, which is something for me. You know, it's amazing. It's, uh, 20 years ago, 30, 40 years ago, no one even knew what a traditional pot looked like. No one was doing them. There were the Smith family in Canada who were doing their style of traditional pots. And maybe one or two or three at the most that were living in New York State in our homelands that did pottery. Now, I think I have a list of 60 people that do some type of pottery, uh, Iroquois style. You know, one of the, Some girl was in, uh, interviewing me um, for college, and she asked me, how come I say Iroquois <laughs> instead of Haudenosaunee? You know? I said, well, I didn't grow up with Haudenosaunee. <laughs> that was, uh, it was always Iroquois, which is kind of tells you how indoctrinated we are, you know, in speaking English. It's, it's life, I guess. Hmm. I wonder, so maybe, I don't see so many more questions, but as we kind of wrap up, if both of you could talk about a or a little bit about like what are your hopes for the future you know like we charted a little bit the increasing visibility of this material or various things but I wonder I don't know what's your hope moving forward like in terms of Manuela for exhibitions and Peter for art making like what's what are we what what are we supposed to hope for for the future <laughs> well I hope that this interest in contemporary native art will continue that this is not you know it's a short-lived trend and uh, I also hope for um, more um, political shows, maybe international shows. Um, I'm currently working on um, a 
a traveling exhibition featuring contemporary indigenous artists from Taiwan, and they are um, similar to Aboriginal artists from Australia. There are often similarities. So if we can include artists um, in these traveling exhibitions from other communities, I think maybe it will contribute to creating more awareness about certain issues because so many of these issues we talked about, like you know the radiation problem, environmental issues, uh, it it really affects indigenous communities first, you know, and um, I think those shows can help create more attention, and hopefully that will help, you know, changing things. Yeah, I hope that uh, more uh, large institutions, museums. Uh, start adding to their collections, start showing things, uh, explaining things is one thing. Uh, there was a show at the Met, which Courtney Leonard was in, and myself, and I think some, I can't think of who the other ones were, but it was a start, you know, and you have to keep at it. I mean, this is all I've done for 60 some years. And uh, I've worked occasionally a real job as the as they used to say, get a real job. <laughs> but I don't know, I, I, there's just so much to learn, put out there. I feel like I'm in a position where I can do that. And having uh, a museum or something behind you, a gallery. Galleries, not so much because they're more important. They're more into uh, making money, uh, sales. Uh, but uh, there are some that are uh, useful as far as showing us, uh, showing how we are really. And uh, I've, gotten away from galleries just for that reason. I haven't done a gallery show in a while, but uh, small galleries, I've done some shows and I'm still teaching uh, what I know. <laughs> you know. I have to teach fast because it's going fast, <laughs> what I know, you know. You can't teach somebody in, uh, in a couple of years, but it's taken you 60 years to learn. Mm -hmm. So we try to teach, we try to teach the way that Audley taught, the way that uh, Hauser taught. It was a, a whole being thing. It's, it's part of your, yourself and who you are and uh, who you want to be. You know, I know a lot of artists that do go for the money, but where does that get you anyway at the end? A painting on a wall somewhere. It's the, it, the uh, recognition that we deserve has to come out sometime. And, uh, a lot of our, I mean, you say we're action expressionists. So, what do you, the title of the show? Action, abstraction, redefined. Yeah, yeah. That's a, that's a moniker, you know, uh, the people that did the work. The thing you said about uh, the young, youngness of a, the artists, uh, I haven't seen that lately. I'm trying to do that with the kids I got now that come in to learn. And uh, to do something that's become well known when you're 16 years old is kind of, you know, awesome, really. It's, uh, and there were a lot of us at the school. You talked about Phyllis Fife. Mm. We're the same age. And her sister, Sandy. Mm. <laughs> you know, it's, it's just been 
one community coming out of that one school. And we all keep in touch with each other pretty much. So, but we don't really share artistic ideas anymore. You know, not, not like uh, Latrec and all those guys getting together at a bar. <laughs> we used to in the, in the younger days, but not anymore. So we only keep in touch by computer or cell phone, whatever. But I think that's a good use for it. <laughs> if I could ask well, one more question about, this is the thing that I keep trying to wrap my head around in the show, is like, I'll see work and the person who created it was 18 years old. And I think about what I was doing when I was 18 years old and it was nothing like this. And so not to like put you on the spot of like how or why this happened, but is there something or anything you might pinpoint to that created this like incredibly generative space where people are so young and making work that like truly stands the test of time and is really extraordinary. Like, what do you, what do both of you, is there anything you think like added to that particular sort of ferment that created this situation? Yeah, I think uh, Peter mentioned it. Uh, it's it's um, letting artists experiment, you know, giving them some tools, some um, resources, but that let them loose. I think that was the recipe for success during the early days of IIA. It was revolutionary before, as we learned, we had Dorothy Dunn, you know, she was um, thinking she did a great job with um, using San Ildefonso Pablo style painting as a model for what she thought native art should look like. Now instead, you know, provide a variety of resources, but then let the young artists experiment. Yeah, we had, uh, at the beginning, we had uh, unlimited supplies. We had materials that reams and reams of canvas. Um, tons of clay, silver, whatever you wanted to work in and jewelry. And uh, it was like putting us in playpen with all this stuff to mess around with, you know? And then they wouldn't really tell us what to do, but they would tell us how we did, you know, how it looked to them. But like I said, it was an experiment for all of us teachers and students. And we, um, we were both trying to do something. We knew we were doing something uh, new. And I think a lot of times that uh, just being able to get away from a reservation at that time, the 60s, that was a, uh, the whole country was in movement. Uh, Everything was changing and we kind of went along with it and we had our own ideas. It was just a matter of putting them out there and learning a skill. I had to learn how to throw before I could do, do a piece. You know. But uh, at first I did uh, hand built, slab built, coil built, but uh, I ended up doing wheel throwing work more than anything. But being able to do that, and like I said, once you leave the, the, the uh, school, then the hard part comes of, you know, where are you gonna work? <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. how are you gonna work? But I had taught myself how to, well, I taught and learned how do you make uh, uh, slab figures? And they ended up in the uh, Indian Arts and Crafts Board collection. And that was in 1970, I believe, 73, maybe. But uh, that's all part of the learning that we had to do. This was so new. We had Oscar Howe as an artist that a lot of people followed. Alan Hauser himself was well known. Fritz Scholder was more or less a newcomer at the time. I went with. Uh, we went with him through his Butterfly series, Stripe series, Mystery Woman, 
you know, all of these series that he did. And then he hit it big with the uh, with the rhinoceros with the BIA branded on its butt. And that was uh, that was his. He tried to get out of doing Indian native uh, stuff, but he just couldn't. I mean, the public wouldn't let him. And so he always went back to it. Even, uh, even before he passed, he was doing more, more of the, uh, the old style that he started. But that's, that's about it. I want to sincerely thank the both of you for talking with us um, and for bringing your work to us. Um, Peter, you said something during this talk that you said, break the mold, but keep the tradition. I feel like that's a really amazing phrase that I could think about for a very long time. This idea of like, what are the things about the past that we want to throw out? And what are the things about the past that we want to carry forward? And so maybe we could end on that as our guiding kind of thought. But thank you both so much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you both as well. Um, and I wanted to thank everybody else for coming to and joining us for today's program. The last day to view action abstraction at the Westmoreland Museum of American Art is this Sunday, May 28th. So make sure you come out and see it before it goes down into its next location. Um, but thank you all so much again, and we hope to see you at the next one. Thank you so much. Have a good night. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.